Um, so today I'm, I'm here to talk about a, a library that I wrote called Grenade. It's a quasi-dependently-typed neural network library in Haskell. Haskell doesn't actually have full dependent types. Um, and because it is but the work of one man, it is also called machine learning, which might blow up in your face. Um, so we've got um, two quite difficult topics to cover, the first of which is how to work an HDMI cable. Um, the first of which is um, neural networks, and the second of which is dependently typed, because I dependently type things. So, but we're going to start with neural networks. Um, so has everyone seen a diagram like this before? It essentially says that each of these little circles is a neuron, and each of the lines between them are weights between the neurons, and each neuron forms a, a sort of summation function and then applies a nonlinear transformation, and it's these nonlinear transformations that allow us to express any function. Right, so neural networks approximate functions and learn to approximate functions. But this is, of course, lies. This is not how neural networks work today. So if anyone shows you a library that does that, they are, um, yeah, walk away. <laughs> Just, yeah. Um, so, yeah, you're better off using something else. Um, so neural networks today are directed graphs. Right, so this um, picture on the right, I don't expect you to read, is for AlexNet. It does um, image recognition. It, you know, you show it pictures of cats versus dogs in the little guy. Yeah, that's a, that's a cat, my friend. Um, so there, there's a lot of different types of layers that go into them. So here I've got some convolution layers and some pooling layers and concatenating them together and then doing inner products. Inner products are essentially the first thing that we saw. Um, and they're used for image recognition everywhere. So this is a directed acyclic graph, but they can also be directed cyclic graphs. So if a, if a normal straight line acyclic graph approximates a function, then directed cyclic graphs approximate programs or learn programs. Um, and so LSTMs are used for things like predicting the next character in a sequence. So you can... You can um, yeah, you can translate text, for instance, if you've got two LSTMs, one going in and one coming out. Um, if you compose them with um, a convolutional layer, then you can do weather prediction. You know, you're looking at a patch in the sky and seeing how the weather patterns are evolving over time. So this is a very big field. Um, and the way that we train them is via reverse automatic differentiation. So we use this, this process, which I'll explain in a little bit, to calculate the partial derivatives of all of the learnable parameters inside our network, right? So every weight is a learnable parameter, and we can backpropagate gradients, or we can use reverse automatic differentiation to calculate the partial derivative for any input and output function and any loss, and then use that to update our things. But there's lots of different ways of um, running these updates. So, you could go to lots of talks about how deep learning works, um, but we're going to move on. I just wanted to, to show you that it is a very deep field. Okay. So what makes a decent neural network library? Well, it has to be pretty quick. It has to be fast. Um, these networks can get quite large, and it can become quite time-consuming to train them. Um, so at a very minimum, you want BLAS support, which unfortunately in the Haskell world means that the AD, AD library won't cut it for you. You need to be able to compose your convolutional layers easily or, or your other types of layers. Um, it's really nice to have recurrent neural networks, although not all of the libraries out there do, but it's good too. Um, and you need to be flexible and have quick turnaround and be good for the program and all of these things. Um, so just a little aside onto automatic differentiation. Who here has heard of it, knows it? Oh, we got a couple. Cool. Um, so this few things. It is not numerical differentiation. You know, you're not just adding a little bit and subtracting a little bit and seeing what the answer is and dividing. It's not that. It's also not symbolic differentiation, which you all probably did in school. Um, and there's two modes of it. There's forward mode, which essentially means that when you perform each calculation, you're bringing along the derivatives of, as well. So like if I have 6 and I want to calculate sine of 6, I also calculate cos of 6 and I, or cos of 1, and then I've got the, the gradient as well. All right? um, and then there's reverse mode, which says that my... my Operation is a graph, and as I go through it forwards, I'm going to remember the inputs of all of the, the points on this graph. And this is called the Wenger tape. Remember that term? I'll use it a little bit later. 
And then we, we go forwards through it and we remember all of these things. And then when we go back, we can go, oh, this is the gradient coming out. Now, how would the output have changed if I changed this a little bit, changed the input a little bit? Um, so to explain that easily, I've stolen a picture from Wikipedia, um, but it didn't help very much, so I replaced all the values. Um, so this is essentially calculating um, sine of x plus x times y. And I've got some input variables here, and you can see that I'm tracking and I'm recording and remembering the partial steps as I go through. And then when I want to do my backpropagation, I can start by backpropagating the 1 down. So this says if I change 34.04 by a little bit, it will change by a little bit, and it's the same little bit. And then as I go through the addition on each side of this addition, if I add a little bit to either side of the addition, the output's going to change by the same amount. So that's why I've got 1 propagating back down. And then as I go back down further, on the very right-hand side, you can see that if I change the y by a little bit, it'll change the output by seven times that amount, by five times that amount, because the x is five. Right? So it's using the other branch, because that's how much that little bit is going to be multiplied by when I go through. Right? So this is just um, tracking my derivatives as I go back down. But you can see that through this process, what I've done is calculate both partial derivatives in essentially a forwards and a backwards path. And this scales quite well, so I can add a thousand more variables and still get one forwards and one backwards path to be able to calculate all of the partial derivatives, which is much more efficient than if you were to, you know, add a little bit and subtract a little bit to every variable. It doesn't scale in the same way. All right. Um, so this was, this was a taunt that I received once. Um, so I was talking about writing a neural network library, and they're like, everyone's got one. Um, and it, you know, and you know. So then I went and I, I looked at Hackage, and and there was some truth to it, but they were all that sort of first picture that I showed you, which, which you shouldn't really use because you're better off using something else. Um, and they also weren't that type safe. Um, so I was a little bit lost until I read this this blog post, which came along. And um, it was actually about dependent types using using neural networks as a as a as a framework to talk about dependent types. Um, if you haven't seen it, I do suggest that you go and read it. And again, it was only a simple type of neural network, but it was framed very well. Um, so this this was the idea. It says that my layer is essentially a. a a weight matrix plus some biases. And these I and O are type level naturals. So they're, they're numbers at the type level, and they're, they're integer numbers, they're natural numbers at the type level. Has anyone used data kinds before? Cool, a few. Um, so these are numbers at the type level. And it says that a network is essentially a list of layers. So it's the, the very basic I have, you know, input layer, a bunch of hidden layers, and an output layer. And they're parameterized based on the size of the input layer, which is this first natural, the hidden layers, the size of the number of neurons in each hidden layer, which is this list of naturals. So this is a list, type level list in Haskell, and the output type. So this is just a type signature, and that's parameterized by a GADT. So it's got two, two constructors, which says I'm either the output layer or I'm connected to another layer. And the constraints just enforce that all of this works out properly. Right? But we can make this more interesting, which is what I did. <laughs> all right, so this is a little bit of a teaser to so what we're going to be doing. This is, um, this is a... This is a neural network which you can write in Grenade. As you can see, it's got two type-level lists. The first one describes the layers that are in the list, and then the second one describes the shapes of data that are passed between the layers, so the data that flows through my neural network. Um, and one of the other nice things about it is this type is really expressive, so we don't actually need to write any value-level code to instantiate a, a, like a, randomly, a random type a random value of this type. We can just call random network, and there's enough information there to be able to just go, OK, I can, I can do this. So one of the ways it works is um, we first of all say, 
what a shape of data is. So in neural networks, you're passing data between the layers, and it has some dimensionality. So it can be 1D, 2D, or 3D. And we just express this as an, AD, as an ADT. This is a type-level natural, or a, a NAT, um, and we're going to use this lifted up to the, to the type language. And then we can instantiate data of this type. So this is, these are concrete implementations of this type, of these shapes. And so if you're 1D, you're a vector. And if you're 2D, you're a matrix. And if you're 3D, you're actually a, just a longer matrix. But all of these are stored in, um, in contiguous memory. So it's just vector storable underneath. And then singletons help us work up and down the type level. So in Haskell, it's got type erasure. So types aren't available at runtime, but you can use singleton types to sort of allow you to quasi-pattern match on your, um, on your types. Um, and I've never seen anyone uh, write singletons by hand before. Normally, people use te template Haskell. Um, these ones couldn't be done with template Haskell because they're a bit complex. But there's a picture of it in case, um, in case you want to know what it actually looks like to write them by hand. And now we can talk about what a layer is in Grenade. So it's parameterized by two type classes. Um, so the first of which says, these are the weights. This is the shape of my, of my weights. And so this is this type gradient of the layer. And if you have no learnable parameters, if you're just a simple function that doesn't, you can't learn anything, this will be unit. And it says, if we want to update our layer, given um, some learning parameters and a layer and gradients for that layer, give me a new layer. That's what this run update is. And I can also create a, la create a layer randomly. And the second class says that I am a layer of a neural network if I can transform data from an input shape to an output shape. So that's what this layer of uh, x is a layer if it has an instance from i to o of these shapes. And it's also got a Venga tape, which is what I said earlier, is the data that I need if I want, when I want to run reverse automatic differentiation. So when I say run forwards, it says run forwards is given a layer and some data of the right input shape, I will give you output data. I will run, my, run myself, run my function. And I'll also give you the information that we need to do reverse automatic differentiation. And when we say run backwards, we say given this layer and that data that, you, that I output before and some backpropagated gradients, and this is of the shape of the, my output, I'll give you the gradients of myself and some the, the, the backpropagated input to push further down the chain. Right, so I can run myself forwards and backwards. Uh, as a concrete example, uh, this is the tanth function, however you pronounce that. It just does hyperbolic tangent. So it has no learnable parameters, so it's just unit on its weights. And when I want to run it forwards, all I need is the data that I, I just need to, to remember the value that was passed in, and I just run tanth. Like, I just run the hyperbolic tangent function and output that. And when I want to run backwards, um, I just take, remember, have that, that data that I remembered, and I just do some basic trig to, with the derivative of the tanth function and then multiply it by the gradient that, that, I'm, that I'm back propagating. All right? Does that make sense? Cool. Um, but I can make more interesting um, instances than that. So at the, at the bottom, I've got a flatten layer. And it says that if I've got some 2D data of dimensions x and y, I can give you some 1D data of dimension a, as long as a is equal to x times y. All right, so these are just type-level numbers up here, and this is just type-level equality. So this is an equality constraint. Cool. Um, and now we can talk about what a network is. So it's pretty similar to what we saw before. It's, um, this, is just a, this is just a heterogeneous linked list, more or less. And it's parameterized, as I said, on the layers of my network and the shapes of data that get passed between the network. All right, so you can either be an empty network of nil, and my input and output is the same shape, it's just i. Or you can be in the, at the head of it, a, you know, a cons, a cons cell on another network. And for that, I've got a constraint that I need to be a layer from an input data to the head of 
the, the network that I'm consing onto. Right? And if I, if I have a layer and a network that I can cons onto, then I am also a network. Okay? Is everyone familiar enough with Haskell type signatures to, to get this? Cool. Um, so here's the basic, the most basic example I can think of. This is just logistic regression. Um, you, you would use this to, like, you know, predict if someone's going to channel from something. And all it says is, given 10 input doubles, form a neural network, do a matrix multiplication, apply a sigmoid function, that's this logit, and, and that's it, right? Um, so I've got two layers. It says that takes in a 10 like length 10 vector, and then gets it down to a length 1 vector, just a single double, applies a sigmoid function to it. And this is something a little bit more complex. So this is a convolutional neural network. Um, so the first convolutional neural network has one channel. So you can see that it's taking in a 28 by 28 2D image, and it's outputting 10 channels, 24 by 24 by 10. And it's got a 5 by 5 kernel and a 1 by 1 stride. Um, and then the pooling layers essentially look at a little patch and say, what's the maximum value in this little patch? And I'll just sort of use that one, use the one that's the max. Um, if, so convolutional layers, for people who haven't heard of them, um, the easiest way to think about it is it's learning a, a kernel filter. So if you've ever done like a blur in Photoshop and like gone into the menu and seen that little matrix, that's a, that's a convolution or a you know, kernel convolution. Um, instead of writing in the numbers in that little matrix that you're applying to each step, it learns them, and it can learn many of them. All right. So we're running our convolution and pooling, and then a nonlinear thing, which we need to do to make it a nonlinear learner or a neural network. And we do that twice and then flatten it out and then run some fully connected. And, and yeah, and this will learn to um, classify digits like this. So. Um, MNIST is a handwriting recognition problem. It's, it's pretty old. Um, but if I was to just use a simple neural network, it would only get about 95% accuracy. But with that neural network, we can do quite a lot better because it essentially is like looking at little bits and saying, oh, there's a curve here. And then as you go a little bit further out, it'll go, oh, there's a, there's a little circle here. And, and, and learn these interesting patterns. And it'll learn them themselves and be able to do that. Um, so. I don't think we've got enough time to really go into this, but there's a really neat trick for making convolution layers fast. Um, so you can turn this sort of, I'm looking at this patch and this patch and this patch, and I'm doing all of these pointwise multiplications and additions, and you can turn that into one matrix multiplication using a thing called the intercol transformation. Um, and I'm happy to talk about it later at the pub. So yeah, come and find me if you want to learn a little bit more about that. Um, so the way that we use my library is um, it's, it's, it's very functional. So essentially, run network is a function which takes a neural network with a bunch of layers and a bunch of shapes and says, if you give me concrete data that is the sh has the shape of the first item in this list, the head of the list, the input shape, then I will give you the output. Crazy. Um, and it will also give you the, the Wenger tapes, all of the tapes that you require, all of the information that you require to do backpropagation. And the gradient is just is very similar. It says if you give me the network, a network of layers and shapes, and all of the information that I need to do backpropagation, and a backpropagated loss, like a gradient of a loss, then I can give you the gradients and also some data which you may or may not need, depending on what you're doing, which is the, the gradients on the input. Um, we can compose this into a function called backpropagate. It is almost trivial. Um, and then we can use uh, an apply update function, which essentially takes all of the gradients for each layer and, and runs the apply functions as it goes along. And you can abstract even further away and just call a function called train, which puts all of these things together. And given some input data and a, and a target variable, will give you a, a new network that's slightly better. And if you've got this function, you can imagine that training over a whole batch of data is just a, a strict fold. It's just a left fold. It's just going, given my initial network, rumble through all of this data and give me a new neural network at the end. Um, so one of the, the more interesting things that I discovered after, after hacking around in this for a while is that you can compose things really easily. Now, it took a few iterations, of course, but... Um, so I can write a layer for a network. I can write an instance of layer for a network, which means I can embed a neural network 
inside another neural network as just a layer of it. Right? And the, the instance for it is actually really simple. So run forwards is just run the network, run backwards is just run the gradient. And this allows me to do things like define um, fully connected sigmoid, so logistic regression, as a network. Right? So I, now I don't need to write fully connected logit, I can just write this FL type. So it simplifies my, my, my types. And I also wrote uh, concat and merge layers. So these essentially will take as parameters two neural networks or two layers, which can be full neural networks because neural networks are also layers, and allow and run both of these branches. And the merge one will just sort of smush their, their values together while concat will stick them next to each other or behind each other depending on um, which instance you use. There's a few instances for it. Um, but allows you to, to write things like this is a residual net, which is um, like if you imagine when you're, you as a human are looking at something, like I'm doing all of these interesting uh, transformations to be able to recognize these words, but I can also see the input. Right? So a residual net allows you to also see the input after you've done your transformations. Okay? Um, so that just becomes essentially one line, and I can, now I can just write residual net, and I've got, I've got this available to me. Um, and the other thing that we can do is, um, is recurrent neural networks. So there's a, there's a separate type, which is recurrent neural networks, um, and we have to sort of tag the, which, if it's recurrent or feed forward in each of the layers, and these feed forward and recurrent types are just essentially tag types, they just define a star to star. So they don't do anything. But they allow me to say, I'm going to run these recurrent layers, and then I'm going to run these feed forward layers in my neural network. Um, and this neural network, what it does is it will, if trained correctly, predict the next character in a string. So you show it 50 characters and then ask it to predict the next one. And so I trained it on some Shakespeare, which is the thing to do. Um, and you can see that I actually got something that almost reads a little bit like Shakespeare. So it, it noticed that at the start of each verse, it's got capitals. And if you've ever seen Shakespeare written, the names are always capitalized for who's speaking. And then it's got the colon, and then it's got a line break, and then it, it has some words. <laughs> which may or may not make sense. I don't think that makes sense, but it doesn't matter. Um, but, it, but it learned all of these things. Um, and it's, it's quite interesting that it, it, it is powerful enough to do that, and like neural networks can learn to do this. Um, yeah, and I think I'm actually really under time. How long have I got? Uh, you, you can go on a bit longer if you want. All right, well, I was just going to say, you know, what's next? <laughs> um, so, so I was thinking about, you know, what's, what's next up for Grenade and... Um, Definitely better type errors is, is one, because they're shit. Um, <laughs> well, it's, it's really difficult. So when you're, when you're writing something like, um, when you're writing something like this, uh, all of these, it, you know, it needs to prove that, that every layer is an instance between the input and the output. And the layer definitions can become a little bit complex. So you've, you can have, for convolution layers, you need to prove that each so you've got these, this kernel that you're applying, and you need to prove that when I step this kernel by the right stride, it fits inside my layer, so that I don't get uh, any overhanging. So this is quite a complex um, constraint condition. And it's got it for X and Y. Um, and there's a bunch of uh, GHC things like this has to, these are all na known natural numbers and, and those sorts of things. But when you get it slightly off, like if you, you know, you can't remember maths and subtraction and division, then it'll give you errors like two is not equal to three. And, and you can imagine it if you wrote that type and received a, an error that two is not equal to three, you'd be a very unhappy camper. <laughs> um, yeah, so I can do my little aside on, on how to make this shit fast if you like. All right, so cool. Um, so, oh, whiteboard would be fucking fantastic. <laughs> uh, so, so, so what you do is, you've got like I, everyone knows what to make a lot of what a convolution is, right? Like what a who's done a blur in Photoshop ever? All right. So you're applying this, this, this matrix and you're multiplying it by essentially all of the channels because you can have lots of channels. So it can be like RGB and you're doing, you're doing, this, matrix multiplica you're doing this multiplication on every point across this grid. And then you're looking at that and then that's the output for that pixel. 
right? So the way you make this fast is you want to just do a single matrix multiplication because people have been writing BLAS since like the 70s and they've optimized the hell out of it and it'll run on your GPU and it'll do all of this stuff. So what you do is you look at each point and you go, all right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then you look, take all of these points and you put them into a row in a different matrix, right? And then you move over and you put it into the next row and then you move over and then you put it into the next row. And then your kernel, like this one, two, like whatever your, your blur is, is just a vector, it's just a column. And if you've got multiple kernels, you've got multiple columns. And then this, this operation, which would be like many, many, many point-wise max, many, 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 many point-wise multiplications and additions just becomes one matrix multiplication across all of these rows, each of which represents one of these patches. Okay? And this is actually quite fast. Um, and I remember when I was writing it in, in Grenade for the first time, I, I sort of wrote it in a, in a very functional, well, in, a, in a not very good form in, in Haskell. It was all, you know, everything was immutable, but I was doing lots of like flattens of little segments of the thing. So there was too much copying going on and it took about 12 hours to train. And I rewrote it in a strict state one out and it took about five hours to train. And then I rewrote it in C and it took 12 minutes. So getting this thing right paid off a lot. But, um, but yeah, when you, when you get it right, it actually can be pretty quick. Um, so yeah, what's, what is actually next is at the moment, um, I'm essentially using uh, HMatrix, which is a, a CPU only um, Haskell library. It's, it's very pleasant to write in, but it's not the fastest thing in the world. Um, but I've had lots of interest in putting it onto the GPU, either by Accelerate, so the dude who wrote Accelerate Trevor was, I was chatting to him on Wednesday and he was interested in helping out there, or just, you know, chucking all of that away and, um, and going for a, for a C library in the back end. Yes, I've got a question. Yes, yeah, so it's about the multiplication panel. Um, Um, so I'm not a BLADS expert, um, but so I, I'm, I'm not sure, but this is the technique that everyone uses, um, including if you look into, I believe when you look at CUDA, this is what they're doing on the GPU as well, they're doing this integral transformation. Yeah, yeah, that'd be cool. All right, well, thank you, Hugh. No worries.